Good evening, Good evening, everyone. everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the portfolio. portfolio. Kevin, do you know what this is? Of course, it's the Michelin Guide. Mm -hmm. My wife's a huge foodie and she had me learn early on in our relationship what this book was all about. I see. I usually don't look at different food guides. I prefer to hear what my friends have to recommend. But I did pick up this New York City 2012 edition because there's something very special about it. What's so special about this year? For the first time, there is a Korean restaurant with a star rating. Oh, Tanji. Yes. I've actually been there recently and the food was amazing. My favorite was the Prugogi slider. Oh, yeah. Oh, you've been there. I have, you, have I guess. been there. I loved the Bosam dish where all the flavor went into the pork. It was so tender, absolutely delicious. Oh, you're making me really hungry right now. <laughs> and the atmosphere and, and the food, everything is just divine. So today we are thrilled to welcome the mastermind behind Tanji. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the innovative chef and owner of Tanji, Huni Kim. Welcome, Huni. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, it's great to be here. How are you? How are you feeling? I'm doing okay. I'm, uh, I'm happy I'm out of the restaurant. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a nice little break. Uh, just... And it's okay for you to be out? Um, yeah, we're in between lunch and dinner service. Uh -huh. uh, so, um, yeah, lunch service just finished about 20 minutes ago. I took a cab up here and I have to be back by 6 o'clock. Wow. So, On yeah. the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was there recently and there was a long line. Is it like that every night? It's gotten a reputation mm -hmm. where you have to wait sort of like an hour every day. Mm -hmm. um, so the rumors are true that even your mother has to wait online? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Before we start, I'd like to go over your bio and give our audience members a glimpse of your life. You were born in Korea but moved to London when you were three, then moved to New York City at 10. Mm -hmm. You attended Bronx High School of Science and was a member of the debate team. You earned your bachelor's degree in science at UC Berkeley, then went to medical school at University of Connecticut. In your fourth year of medical school, you took a year off and enrolled at the French Culinary Institute, a nine-month program. Then you worked for the top French restaurant, Daniel, for, th for two years, then at the best Japanese restaurant, Masa, for another two years. Then you ran a private kitchen for a year, and in December 2010, you opened a Korean restaurant, Tanji, in Hell's Kitchen, and the rest is history. What an extraordinary journey you've had up to now. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, but uh, before we go into everything, I wanted to kind of go back to your childhood. And okay. I, I know that you moved to London when you were three. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the situation was where we moved to England, but I, all I remember is my mother working at the Korean Embassy in London. Mm -hmm. in father? Korea. My father passed away when I was two. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually um, uh, a captain of a, of a fleet of ships. Mm -hmm. And I know he passed away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Okay. I didn't know my father was deceased until I was about seven years old. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was sort of protected from that. Uh, it was always, I had never asked for him really on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but when I was old enough to realize, where is he? Um, it, I was I was told that he was at work in the middle of the ocean. Mm. I'd be back soon, and then uh, it, I guess it worked till I was seven uh, when I was finally told that you know he had passed away. Well, uh, back to London. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what was the most difficult part about growing up in London? Wow, um, being Asian. Mm -hmm. I went to boarding school. I was the only Asian. Mm -hmm. um, this boarding school was about three and a half, three hours west of London. I was the only Asian in the entire town. Wow. So when we used to go out on field trips to farms, to the city, everybody would stare. Mm. I don't think there was much teasing, you know, that really didn't affect me, but always knew I was different. And then at the age of 10, you got to come back to New York City. Mm, mm. In the 80s, there was still a lot of racism. Mm. I was called a chink every day. When you're younger, I think 10, 12, 13, you sort of, attack your friends mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the teasings and all of that without any right. sort of uh, guilt. But uh, um, high school, it got better. Um, That's great. And then I went to college where 
is more than 50% Asian. Yeah. <laughs> Teams in high school, we hear you are a very talented debater. I think growing up, living sort of with my mom, speaking Korean to her, I was always sort of a little bilingual, but not having somebody to speak English with at home every day, I don't think I was very good at sort of expressing my feelings, emotions verbally. Mm -hmm. and, and I sort of realized that, um, and debate and speech was, I thought, to me, something I should really try to learn mm -hmm. at a young age. And that is why I joined the debate team. Bronx Science has and had the best debate team in the country. It allowed me to, every week we were going to tournaments all over the country. You know, California, Iowa, Texas, North Carolina, where I encountered real racism and from teachers even. Uh, and, th and they had no ill feelings, but they saw me and they were like, oh wow, your English is perfect. Would you mm -hmm. mind coming to my class and, you know, showing my students how Asian, Asians can speak great English. <laughs> pure, and that was, that, was, that was South Carolina. It was a great way for me to just see the whole country all four years of high school. Well, it must have been wonderful for you to be at Bronx uh, High School Science mm -hmm. uh, because there were so many Asian faces there. Was it your choice to go to that school? Bronx Science, yes. There was always a choice, Bronx Science versus Stuyvesant. And even now, I think it's Stuyvesant or Bronx Science. For me, um, living in Manhattan at that time, you always dream about a school with a campus. Mm -hmm. uh, Stuyvesant was one building in the middle of a Manhattan street. Bronx Science actually had a really nice campus where the students hung out uh, in front of a really big park. There were, I think, about 2,000 students. Uh, we sort of were one unit sharing a campus. Uh, and it had more of a sort of a family sort of atmosphere. What prompted you to go on to med school? I don't know. Science to me made sense. It was just logical. I was just attracted to that. So not much pressure from your parents to be a doctor or anything mm, like that? Well, the pressure came when I really didn't know what to do after college. Mm. Uh, it was sort of, it wasn't really pressure, but they were like, if you don't know what to do, be a doctor. <laughs> uh, and. Well. Yeah, I started working for the, the Cornell Medical School uh, neurosurgery department uh, starting in college. Every summer I'd come back, I'd work there for the summer. You know, the doctors that I worked for, they seemed to be happy people, uh, smart, intelligent. Um, so I thought I could see myself being a doctor. Well, in your fourth year of medical school, mm. you, you stopped attending med medical school mm -hmm. and enrolled at the French Culinary Institute. Mm. How did that transition happen? <laughs> Medical school isn't like college. It's pretty hard. Um, you know, you're devoting 16 hours a day just studying one thing, you know, medicine. Uh, that, was, that was difficult for me because I didn't have the passion. And um, I had to take some time off because I was sort of getting headaches. Basically, my doctor said, take, a, take some time off, you know, because once you start your residency, a neurosurgery at that time was a six-year residency, residency program. So for six years, you're pretty much uh, committed. Um, so I thought it was a good idea to take a year off and do just travel. But from medicine to food, that's, that is such a, a like big a, jump. Um, <laughs> and you know, at first I did think so. I, I never thought while I was in school that I would ever be a cook. I didn't know how to cook. There was interest growing up in New York going to restaurants. Now, I've always had a passion for good food. My mother, you know, was busy with her company and everything, so I ate most of my meals at restaurants. You were married at the time when you said, honey, I'm dropping out of med school, I'm gonna go to the No, French I never said that. I, I said, <laughs> uh, I need a year off ah. before I go back. So instead of, tra well, I have no money, so uh, why don't I just, apply, you know, go to culinary school, you know, cook, learn how to cook, and cook for you. <laughs> oh, so it's uh, all in the presentation well, of yeah, how you yeah, sold it. Yeah. Nice. And I had no idea that I was going to give up medicine. How about your mom? She must have oh, been no, shocked. Oh no, she was not happy. <laughs> she was not happy. She didn't believe in uh, sabbaticals. Uh -huh. She didn't believe in taking a year off. My mother never really told me what to do, not which school to go to, what made. Mm. She never told me. She always trusted me. When I did decide, make that decision to not return to medicine, uh, she was very upset. She knew in her heart that this was probably the biggest mistake I will ever make and that I will be haunted by it. And if she didn't step in to stop me and show me the light, that she was going to regret it. 
Hi everyone! Today we are delighted to visit Mrs. Yoon Jung Che, the mother of Huni Kim. Let's see what she has to say about Huni's rise to success. 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. 우리 Huni 얘기 들어왔어요. 너무 충격적으로 받아들였기 때문에 제가 좀 시간이 필요했어요. 사실은 아 엄마가 너무 바쁘게 살아서 우리 아들한테 밥을 제대로 못 해줘서 얘가 갑자기 이런 식으로 가는지 그런 생각 좀 많이 했어요. 그게 참 엄마 입장에서 힘들고 그랬어요. 데니엘에서 일한다 그랬을 때 어, 저희 친구들이 갔다 와서 얘기를 하더라고요. 훈이한테 가봤다고. 그래서 이제 그 다음에 제가 갔어요. 그 더운 날, 그이긴 소매에, 긴 바지에 모자까지 쓰고 애가 앞에서 그불 앞에서 일을 하는데 얼굴이 익었더라고요. 엄마가 바라는 아들은 넥타이를 메고 건사하게 앉아서 대접을 받는 아들을 원했지. 그 부엌에서 그 더운데 기가 막히더라고요. 솔직히 얘기하자면 그 미슐랭을 받았을 때 그때 아 얘가 천직이구나 정말 좋아하는구나. So how did you end up getting a job at such a prestigious restaurant right out of cooking school? Uh, well, you know, it was, like you said, it was a nine-month program, and I had three mm -hmm. months to kill. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, why not sort of go to the best restaurant and learn, since I only have three months. So I got a stage there, which is sort of like an internship. You're working without getting paid. Um, but for me, that was, that was not a, an issue. I always thought that was a continuation of my education after mm -hmm. graduating uh, culinary school. And then two weeks in, the executive chef, Jean-Francois, actually uh, offered me a job. Two weeks uh, in? Two weeks wow. in. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that in this environment, you were the only Asian. Is it uh, rare for an Asian to be in um, French cooking? There were quite a few Asians. Before, actually, Danielle was, was, became sort of a famous restaurant with Alex Lee, who was a Chinese chef. He was the executive chef for yeah. a very, very long time. And then, um, and who was fluent in French, of course. Uh, Are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, I don't know the curse words. Yeah, that's, I figured that. <laughs> but, um, so there has always been sort of, you know, an Asian um, population in the fine dining industry. Um, but at that time, I think it was just per chance that I was the only Asian. I was the only Asian for about a year until they, until a couple of more came in. So you were at Daniel for two years. Mm -hmm. Was that enough time to master French cuisine? Um, you know, I thought I had learned everything after the first year. <laughs> 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 um, and, and it was such a tough kitchen where I thought, okay, I'm ready to move on. But there was something in me saying that, well, I know everything about the cooking. Have I mastered it? And I wasn't there yet. I don't know that if I've mastered everything in, in French cuisine as a whole, but I think at Danielle I've learned enough where I know Danielle as a person, I know Danielle as a chef, and if he told me to make something, I can make it his way. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is enough to know about a restaurant. When you are, feel so confident of what your chef wants you to do, where you can just recreate something. So you went from French, a French restaurant mm -hmm. to a Japanese restaurant. Mm. Even the French restaurants, even at Danielle, we started using Japanese ingredients. We started using uh, Middle Eastern spices. I knew that the way to go is to not just learn French, but to learn as many different kinds of cooking as possible. And I thought, you know, the extreme end to, to French, I thought Masa was the best restaurant. And you were at Masa also for two for years? two years, yes. So is that pretty common for somebody to go study with a celebrity chef, a star chef, and then after a couple of years go off and start their own restaurant? In two years, I think, is, is above average. I think most cooks stay a year. If they stay for two, then for me, it's my job to make the management. So Tangji opened, as you mentioned, it hasn't been two years. It was mm. December of 2010? Yes. So just over a year, just actually. Over a year, yeah. yeah, and mm -hmm. you've achieved 
tremendous success in such a short period of time. Did yeah. you expect that? No, no, no. <laughs> Sashimi, spicy wings, pork slider, sable, skirt, paella. Be like one, two, three, four sables all day. Tanji mean? We have these books uh, for my, my son Sean and it's Korean English. So there was this one book that had a bear carrying this jar that said honey on it and in the bottom it says Tanji in Korean. So it's like, um, so we thought, oh, I thought Tanji meant honey. And I thought that was a good name for a restaurant, right? Honey. Uh, and then my wife was like, no, honey, that's not what it means. It's the actual container. Okay. So I thought, oh, better. Because, <laughs> you know, we were a very small restaurant, and we thought, you know, a, a, a tanji is a small vessel that, that holds food. Just made sense. Yeah. Mm. This past year, you've had so much media exposure, mm. and the critics love tanji, the customers love tanji. What do you think, what do you think is the main appeal of your restaurant to these um, people? We were very um, um, fair in our pricing. We were very confident in our abilities to please our customers. We didn't get any media attention for a good three, four months. Um, our first big review was New York Magazine, which is such a huge magazine. Once they gave us the four stars, it was on everybody else's radar. You are not officially trained in Korean cuisine, so how did uh, you learn? I think if you're a chef mm -hmm. who is confident with your skills and your palate, there are no boundaries, there are no borders. For, for Korean food, same thing. If I think this Korean dish is good, it's gonna be good for everybody. The next step, which after the palate, is trying to recreate something. Now, being a chef, we have these um, recipes. Anybody can follow a recipe. It is my job, after making that recipe, to taste it and then to fix it. Mm -hmm. Because the onions will never be the same kind of sweetness. The garlic will ne never have the same kind of... Every live ingredient is gonna be different. So if you just follow the same recipe every time, every day that, thing's, that, that dish is going to taste different. That's not what you want. What you do then is you make something, you taste it, and then you remember what it should taste like and then to fix it. That skill can carry over to any kind of cuisine. I was familiar with gochujang, changgirum, all these Korean ingredients. So for me to taste a Korean dish, having never made it, mm -hmm. I can taste it and be like, this has this, this, this in it, and wow. this, this, this in it. Mm. So let's uh, try to make it. You build your recipe that way. Two weeks later, you add something to it. And every dish at Danji has gone through such, mm. such a transformation since we opened. Not a single dish is the same. Did you go to Korea to sample many different dishes? Uh, well, I would go to Korea every year. Korean restaurants, it just tastes different when you're in Korea. <laughs> I agree. You, you cannot replicate, and, and it hasn't been replicated. Right. I don't know what it is, but yeah. you go to Korea and you have this tenjang jjigae that was made by this grandmother who's been making it for 40 years. You can't, you can't taste that anywhere outside of Korea. Uh, and for me, that's what I wanted to create. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to sort of share that flavor with, with these New Yorkers who think they know Korean food. We also know that the uh, First Lady of Korea came to your restaurant, yes. and that was an incredible experience, I'm sure. Can you tell us a little bit about that particular experience? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Were you surprised when you got the call? Was, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, 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 we got a phone call. Um, do they do it like the United States? Like, Please hold for the Mr. President. No, no, I never got to talk <laughs> oh, to them. Okay. Uh, it was, it was their, their I, I guess, the Blue House. Uh, they wanted to sort of have a luncheon for the First Lady in, in, at our restaurant. And we're like, sure. Uh, it's not going to be cheap. <laughs> we're going to have to close down the restaurant. But, uh, so. Well, the First Lady is, is doing a tremendous job of promoting internationalizing mm -hmm. Korean food mm -hmm. now. So how wonderful that you were a part of her mission. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very thankful that she vis visited us. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of my favorite Korean ingredients uh, that is very authentic is uh, sook. 
And okay. I grew up uh. eating it, loving it in the springtime. Okay. Uh -huh. The soup. soup. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say soup in English, actually. It's <laughs> I don't actually know what the word is. Chrysanthemum leaves. Oh. Chrysanthemum leaves. Yes, okay, yes. interesting. Oh. Or, or, or weed. <laughs> we, it, it, exactly, yeah. right? I mean, people let's go with legal, in the Let's mountains. go with the legal ingredient. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have any intention of, of using that in, in any of your uh, dishes? No, we do use it. We do use it from May uh, to about September. Uh -huh. And we use it um, two ways. Uh, when we do a meuntang, uh, we put it in, sort of give it that brightness. Um, and then we also use that as a garnish. Where do you get your souk? Well, um, <laughs> it's difficult to, to get in Korea, uh, to, in the U.S. Uh, American purveyors don't really sell it. They don't, you know, to them it's not a vegetable. The easiest way for us to get it is because our restaurant is five blocks away from Central Park, and Central Park has chrysanthemum leaves growing in certain areas. Wow. Um, <laughs> we forage for these. Well, I send my cooks uh, between lunch and dinner time to forage. And uh, wow, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, that's music, yeah. yeah. Well, Central Park has a wealth of Ginkgo ingredients. Nuts, and, uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. Mulberries, and, yeah, trees. Very fortunate for us to sort of live near, uh, or, well, to have the restaurant near uh, Central Park. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I always wondered about chefs is when you go home after a long day at work, mm. do you cook for your family? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I come home uh, 1 a.m. Mm. and I leave, you know, like 10 a.m. Mm. So it's, I don't really have an opportunity to cook. And that Sunday that I have off, it's actually my one day that I can go visit my friend's restaurants, uh, see what other restaurants are doing, which is so very important mm. in running a restaurant in New York. You really need to sort of be inspired by other restaurants. One of my best friends, when he knew, when he heard you were going to be on the show, he asked me to ask this question. It's just, but what kind of pans do you use at home? <laughs> I mean, just because people find okay. that, you know, if um, you're using this professional grade well, food comes it's, out it's, one it's way. It's funny. Um, my wife and my mother-in-law actually cooks at home. Um, and they have a difficult time cooking with the pans that we have at the restaurant. We you cook with all clad. Mm -hmm. And with all clad, you need to sort of, everything sticks yes. if you don't know how to cook it well. Right. You need, it has to have a certain temperature yes, exactly, in order to exactly. cook. Exactly. And so you have to understand heat yes. very, very well. Do you have any uh, good advice, words of wisdom for the aspiring chefs in the audience? Being a chef, being a cook is probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest jobs, physically and mentally. It is a profession where it is so hard where money doesn't compensate. Meaning, if it was just for the money, you couldn't do it. The most successful chefs run the best restaurants because there is this desire to please. And it's not just about the food. When somebody enters your restaurant, we want to please them in every single way, whether with the decor, the music, the service, the ambiance, everything. And innately, you need to have that. You can't learn that. So, Huni, with all the success, do you have plans to expand Danji, create a food empire? What are your goals? Um, I think, I think Danji is going to stay where it is, and and I don't think there's any changes to Danji. Danji, when I was uh, opening up my first restaurant, Danji, um, you know, I thought so much of it, and it had a beginning. Uh, it had structure, like all everything on the menu, the service. It had. Everything was consistent, and I don't think this can be recreated at another at another place. I think if I, when I open up my next restaurant, which is planned, it has to be a new story. I have to start from the beginning, look at the space, look at the kitchen, look at the neighborhood, and sort of see what is it that I have to to sort of what story, what new story can I tell about Korean food.